welcome back to my channel beautiful minutia if you're new here my name is tiffany and today i'm going to talk about the books that i read in april so if you saw my may tbr then you already know that i was pretty slumpy in april and i have a decent amount of books here to talk about but a good chunk of them were books i had already started in another month or they were like graphic novels or manga or they were short or all of the above <laughs> so it is definitely probably a smaller list than normal and also because I was kind of struggling my way through the month a bit I think that there were quite a few books that I could have enjoyed more maybe if I had read them at a different time when I wasn't feeling so slumpy but I had very few five stars. I'm going to split these up into genres so if you want to skip around you can. I don't even know who I am because I actually read quite a few non-fiction in the month of April and one of which I had started in February but the others I didn't. I started and finished during the month of April and they were all biographies or memoirs. So the book that I started in a previous month is Romantic Outlaws by Charlotte Gordon and I started this book in February for We Love Jenny and then March was just so busy with middle grade March and all the things in March that I just didn't finish it. I didn't pick it up at all in March, I don't think. So I read the second half of this pretty much. It was like the last 40% or so that I finished in the month of April. And gosh, I just loved this book start to finish. I think that it can be kind of a sad and horrible read in one respect because you're finding out about the lives of these women and how difficult their lives were some of which was of their own choosing and some of which was certainly not but in case you haven't heard me talk about this book already this is a biography a dual biography about Mary Shelley and her mother Mary Wollstonecraft both of them were definitely very involved in the feminist movements of their time and some of what they did was revolutionary and amazing and some of it was one of those kinds of things where it was like well if men can do this then then we should do this too without kind of stopping to think about well should men even be doing this there was a huge movement towards free love during this time period which is really really interesting because it's in the regency and pre-regency time period that a lot of this book takes place and that's not a time period where you typically think of that but there was definitely some influence in Mary Wollstonecraft's life especially from living in Paris during the French Revolution and kind of their free thinking about free love and all those kinds of things but you just see the havoc it wreaks on these ladies lives some of the choices that they made and then again like I said some of the things were not their choices the way that women were treated as property and just generally abused and tossed aside so frequently during this time period where they had no rights of their own no ability to just kind of walk away from marriages and it was really really difficult to read about the way that they were treated but their lives were just filled with a lot of tragedy even though they were both such brilliant women. Being a homeschool mom myself one of my favorite components of this book was Mary Wollstonecraft's views on education and how each child should be viewed as their own individual person which really really lines up with Charlotte Mason's educational philosophy which is what we tend to implement in our homeschool. And so she saw them as having their own unique giftings, desires, interests, and abilities and teaching to that rather than just teaching a blanket overall. And there are things that every child needs to know, like reading and math. And obviously she acknowledged that, but she also acknowledged really pouring into the things that they were interested in and really good at. And so I really loved her focus on education and a lot of it really aligned with me. So that was something that I really loved. But honestly, this book was just riveting some of it felt like it wasn't even real because I'm like how could this really be their lives it read like a soap opera at times and it was like unput downable at certain points and I also think that it really explained a lot of Mary Shelley's mentalities in a lot of the books that she wrote some of which were popular I mean the one that's the most popular nowadays and is easily accessible is Frankenstein but she wrote a lot more than that and it really gives a lot of insight into what was going on in her life and her mentality behind some of the books that she wrote and so that is something that I also really appreciated about it. I gave this one five stars and loved it so much. For Alcott 
that April, my prompt was to read a nonfiction about Louise May Alcott. So I read Marmee and Louisa. This is actually nonfiction that my mother-in-law gifted me a few years ago and I finally got to read it. I had the perfect time to read it. And so that was really exciting. And hilariously enough, quite a few of my other Alcott April co-hosts also picked this up for their nonfiction and we did not plan that at all. So it was almost like an impromptu buddy read in a way because we were able to discuss a lot of the things that happened in this book. So obviously this book is a biography of Louise May Alcott and her mother, Abigail May. And my goodness, what an incredible book this was. I was just like, there were so many things that I didn't know. And it was really, really interesting, actually, some of the tie-ins between this book and Romantic Outlaws, because Louise May Alcott's father was one of the transcendentalists and was very much focused on philosophy, really wanted like communal living with people who had the same mentality that he did. And the way that he viewed work as opposed to like, he felt like he shouldn't have to provide for his family because philosophy should come first. And it was really weird, some of the parallels between Bronson Alcott and Percy Shelley reading this on the heels of Romantic Outlaws. I was really, really surprised. And also just some of the ways that like, the mother influenced the daughter. Although I think that Abigail May not only had a more positive influence on her daughter than Mary Wollstonecraft did on Mary Shelley, but also a longer one because Mary Wollstonecraft died very shortly after giving birth to Mary Shelley. So they had a very, very close relationship in this. And it was really interesting to see all the threads, especially having read and absolutely adored Little Women, seeing the threads of things in her real life that then she incorporated into Little Women. And and her childhood and even adult years were definitely very difficult and very sad at times but I really really enjoyed reading about this family and reading also a lot about Abigail May's brother Samuel Joseph who was really like up and coming for his time in terms of being an abolitionist and wanting women's rights and then also civil rights for freed black slaves as well he was just very revolutionary in his time and it was really inspiring to read a lot about his life as well. I did feel like parts of the book were a bit repetitive at times but I really really loved it. The last nonfiction that I finished was The Girl with Seven Names by Hyun Zhou Lee and I seem to have misplaced my copy so whatever there'll be an image on the screen. This is a memoir about a woman who defected from North Korea and it is such an interesting perspective. This is actually my first North Korean defector story that I've read and I want to read more because I know that her experience in a lot of ways is not widespread and that she actually grew up with a fairly positive childhood in North Korea. Although I think a lot of North Koreans have an issue where they have been told so many things that they've believed are true that they don't realize how bad the situation they're living in is. The propaganda and brainwashing is that intense. And Hyun So Lee definitely talks about that, but because she grew up in a family that was very loving and also had money and social status, her experience in North Korea was not as negative as even some of her friends, which she later discovers. And when she leaves North Korea, it's just because she wants to cross the river into China to say that she did because her younger brother did it all the time. And her intention was always to come back and not to leave permanently. And so her story is very different than people who are intentionally escaping North Korea because of starvation or poor living conditions or whatever. It's so different from that. And reading her leaving China and then ending up in South Korea and just the changing of her mindset and the way she acclimated to freedom was so fascinating. I was absolutely gripped by this memoir. Let's move on to middle grade. I'm incorporating graphic novels in this section as well. I could put graphic novel and manga together, but I'm not going to, so that's okay. The manga that I read is horror, so I'm gonna group it with the one other horror story that I read this month, so that way, I don't know. I don't need to explain that to you. Anyways, so, middle grade. I had one middle grade story that I had carried over from middle grade March and that is Momo from Michael Endy. This is totally a we love Jenny read. Jenny read this because Suho's gray suit album was based on like the concept of this book and this book is so 
interesting. So it is about a little girl named Momo who lives in this community and these people come in in gray suits and they basically convince people that they are wasting their time and they need to save up their time in a time bank. So they have to give their time to these people uh, because they're wasting their time. So they have to give them to these people to put them in this time bank. And meanwhile, their lives become hectic and they no longer have any spare time for themselves or anything like that. So it's a very interesting concept that obviously deals very heavily with time. Like what is time? What do you use time for? What does it mean to have time well spent versus time wasted? Is time resting and relaxing and being with family? Is that wasted or is the only time that is like well spent time that's focused on ambition or money or being productive and so there's a very interesting conversation being had here it's told in such a delightful way but in the same respect even though it's told in a childish way i kind of wonder if it's a concept that would resonate with very many children so if you've read this book when you were a child i would love to know your thoughts because i just don't know if it's to like I don't know over kids heads the concept of time but then in the same way the way that it's written is very fairy tale esque and is also like very obvious so it's not it's too heavy handed I think for adults but I don't know if the concept is too abstract for children regardless I absolutely loved this book in some ways like the cleverness of it reminded me a bit of the Phantom Tollbooth without the same level of humor and puns but it was just really cleverly written and so it reminded me of that I really really loved it for my reader read project I had a middle grade this month and that was Caddy Woodlawn I'm only going to talk really briefly about this because I DNF'd it. I was already feeling slumpy and I wasn't buddy reading this with anyone so I was under no obligation to continue it. This is a classic about a young girl growing up and with her brothers and she's very much a tomboy and wants to do all the things that the boys are doing and she's just kind of wild and feral in some ways as opposed to like her prim and proper sisters she definitely more spends time with and resonates with her brothers more and I could tell that this book was well written it just was kind of boring for me and part of that I think is because I'm not the intended age demographic part of that is just because I wasn't in the mood to read this but I just I was like ah well it's fine but it just wasn't one that I was interested in. I didn't have any nostalgic attachment to this whatsoever. I've had this on our shelves for years, probably at least six years. I've had this book on our shelves. I've never read it out loud to my daughter. My daughter's never wanted to pick it up on her own and I've just now picked it up. And I think it would be more enjoyable as a read aloud for a younger child than my daughter. Graphic novels. So I had two middle grade graphic novels that I read this month. The first one was the third Lightfall book, which is called The Dark Times by Tim Probert. I read the first two Lightfall books, adored them both, gave them both five stars. This one didn't make it for me. And part of the reason for that is that it's been too long that I've read volume two and I didn't remember some of the storyline. So this is a fantasy story and as a result there's a lot of like world building and lore that happens particularly in volumes two and three and there's traveling, going to different places, finding out the history of different things which is really interesting and really solid world building but in the same respect because I didn't remember some things from volumes one and two there wasn't really a big refresher in this book at all unlike a lot of middle grades that I read. So I was just kind of like feeling like, oh, I don't know the relevance of this. So I really it still enjoyed it. I thought the artwork was beautiful. But if you're planning on reading Lightfall Volume 3, and you haven't yet, do yourself a favor and brush up on Volume 1 and 2 first. The other graphic novel I read, I picked up on a whim at my library when I went to pick up some books that I had on hold, and that is A Sky of Paper Stars by Susie Yee. This is a book about a Korean-American girl and kind of this 
feeling of like, where do I fit and where do I belong? Because her parents have come over from Korea and worked really hard to get to where they are. And so she feels like she doesn't quite fit in with the American kids in her school because of how she's been raised. And her parents, you know, pack her this lunch every day and she just wants to eat school lunch like all the other kids she just wants to fit in and then um she goes back to korea because her grandmother has passed away and she goes there and she doesn't feel like she fits there either and so it's just it's so beautifully told i think it's it actually i feel like doesn't have a ton of dialogue in it i mean it it does i guess but you you've got pages like this and that's not a ton of dialogue you know it's a lot of pictures and so it's very simply told but it's so beautifully told and i actually cried when i read this and i absolutely loved it moving on to horror i'm putting my manga volume here so i read attack on titan volume 10 so i'm almost a third of the way through this series and oh my gosh i'm reading this with christy Liz from dostoevsky in space oh my gosh each volume just keeps getting so much more interesting and i am so just enthralled with this story it is about this dystopian world where there are these giant humanoid monsters called titans that are like eating people and so it does get gruesome at times and that's where the horror element comes in and also the titans themselves are fairly like grotesquely pictured at times but it just like the the character development is so good like we get backstories from characters in pretty much every single volume and you start getting really attached to side characters not even like the main players in the game but side characters you get so attached to them and learning their motivations and stuff but in addition to that the past several volumes have had some major plot reveals that actually make you ask more questions and go like what the heck is going on here it is so so good i am loving it the other horror that i read i don't it's not super horrifying i it's like horror light maybe i read another t king fisher book nettle and bone read this with stephanie from miss richards reads and this was another we love jenny inspired pick because i know jenny really really loved this t king fisher i think she liked other ones too but she really loved this one i think this might have been her favorite but i'm not totally sure so this is basically a dark fairy tale and it is about a young girl who is the youngest of three princesses and there's kind of some some things happening where there's some political positioning that's happening with the girl's mother marrying off the daughters to this other kingdom so that way they can keep the peace and and have the protection of this other kingdom her first sister dies at the beginning of the book after being married for a very short amount of time to the prince of this kingdom and then her next oldest sister the middle sister kind of like takes her place. So in the meantime, Mara, our main character, is sent to a convent. So that way she's kind of almost being kept in reserve for this prince, potentially, if something happens to her other sister. And so it's set in this fantastical world. And there are elements that are certainly very creepy. But overall, this was much more, I think, a story of like found family and love slash revenge <laughs> i think it was more of those elements than it was horror although i think it is classified as a horror because there are some really creepy elements in it i was anticipating for this to be my absolute favorite t kingfisher book and it's not unfortunately and part of that i think is because i was feeling slumpy at the time I would, had a really difficult time investing in the plot and the characters. Like the character of Mara is supposed to be in her 30s. She lives in the, at the convent for like 15 years or something like that. So she's like 30 years old. And the way that she talks and acts feels much more almost like YA. I wouldn't say this has like all the YA tropes or anything like that, but it, she feels like a YA prot protagonist and not 
a 30 year old woman. So I wasn't as invested in her, although I did really like a lot of the characters around her. I didn't think she was an unlikable character. I just wasn't rooting for her the way that I think I was intended to. And it's hard for me to know whether or not that is because I was slumpy or because of some of the issues that I had with it. But I still really enjoyed it. I liked it but I didn't love it as much as I was hoping I would. The only fantasy book that I read this month was The Voyage of the Basilisk by Marie Brennan. This is book three in the Memoirs of Lady Trent series, which is about a woman living in kind of like a Victorian time period, but it's in a fantasy world and she wants to be a naturalist that studies dragons. And so each book just follows her different journeys to that end. And so in this book, she is on a ship called the Basilisk and she travels all over the place and sees dragons in different areas, gets herself in some conundrums and in the middle of some very political posturing, which has happened in every single book so far, she somehow finds herself right at the center of some sort of political political conundrum. And I really enjoyed this one. I struggled with book two in a lot of ways. And some of the struggles I had with book two, which was mainly that there was a lot of different people groups that we were dealing with in this one country that she went to. And I was having a lot of trouble keeping a lot of the names straight. I still had some of the issues of that in this book, because she travels to so many different locations. And so it was kind of difficult for me to keep all of that straight in my brain but this book was like really action-packed and I don't have the same complaints that I have from book two where it took forever until she finally saw dragons. We get dragons like towards the beginning of the book we get some like really exciting stuff with like sea serpents and like fire lizards and like different all these different dragons in different locations and just her relationships with some of the native people and some of the areas that she ends up that are really really interesting so I liked this better than book two but book one was like perfect five stars and this is probably more like a four I still found it really enjoyable but it just didn't quite meet that level. Okay, last section is the classics. So I read three classics this month, one of which I started in March, and that was Willa Cather's Five Stories. I think I read two of them in March and three of them in April, maybe, or the other way around. I don't really know. So just as a refresher, in case you didn't see any of my previous videos that tells you which short stories are in here. There's The Enchanted Bluff, Tom Outland's Story, Neighbor Razaki, The Best Years, and Paul's Case. So I really, really loved some of these short stories. Like the ones that I loved the most were Neighbor Razaki and The Best Years. Neighbor Razaki is for sure my favorite. And I read this with Dia from Novel Idea and she said Neighbor Razaki is like her absolute favorite Willa Cather thing she's ever read. And she's read more than I have. And I just love it. It is such a wonderful story. A lot a lot of the stories in this book do have to do with like small farming communities, particularly neighbor Razaki and the best years. Paul's case also has to do with like a farming community, but a boy that feels like he doesn't fit in there and he wants to live in a bigger city and be rich and be affiliated with actors and musicians and artists and all that kind of stuff. So it does deal kind of differently there. Tom Outland's story has to do with like New Mexico and mesas down there and the Enchanted Bluff has to do with kind of like some country kids who want to go to an Enchanted Bluff somewhere someday. So they all kind of have like a country vibe to them but I do think that some of the stories were more satisfying and more able to be invested in than others but overall I would say I gave this whole short story collection as a whole four stories because the only one that I didn't really enjoy was Tom Outland's story. Part of that I think is that it's an excerpt of another book as opposed to being an independent short story but also I think I just didn't like the setting of the mesa as much as I do when she does like prairies and farming life. For Alcott April our group read was The Inheritance. So this is a story that Louise May Alcott wrote when she was 17 years old and it was never published until like 30 years ago or something like that. It was published in the 90s. It wasn't even discovered until the late 80s. And so as a result of her writing it so young, I can kind of forgive some of the issues that I had with it, but I didn't really enjoy reading this that much, honestly. I felt like the prose itself was fine, 
but this is a story of a young girl named Edith who is an orphan from Italy being raised by a wealthy family in England. And so it's basically like her story kind of almost being less than she's been raised alongside their daughter as like a companion slash governess. So it's kind of interesting in that there's a lot that happens that is interesting in this story but I felt like every single character was very flat and one-dimensional. So we have Edith and then we also have Lord Percy who is the romantic interest of the story and both of them are just like perfect angels. So good. Their motivations are always perfect and that is their only personality trait is that they are just like perfect righteous moral human beings and then we have some other characters whose motivations are less than good and their entire personality is just kind of being like snotty and conniving and that is really like all there is really to them and so it, for me I just as a result of them being very very flat I wasn't very interested in the plot because I just couldn't get as invested so I think that the rest of my Alcott April co-hosts actually enjoyed this book quite a bit more than I did but I saw someone describe it as Jane Austen fan fiction <laughs> And I actually feel like it kind of felt like that. There was a lot of elements to it that were very reminiscent of Mansfield Park with some vibes from A Little Princess thrown in. And also there were elements of Agnes Grey that I recognized here also, but without the character depth. So I just, yeah, it felt like a conglomeration of books that probably inspired her. But again, she was only 17 years old. So I don't want to be too harsh, but we did a watch along of the movie and I actually enjoyed the movie a lot more. The movie was set in America, which seemed to fit the story quite a bit more. And the changes that they made, they did make some pretty drastic changes in certain aspects, removing some characters and replacing them with someone else and stuff. But I actually feel like all those changes were positive. And I think that if I had watched the movie first, I might have enjoyed the book a little bit more because I would have had more of like fond feelings for the movie because I really actually did enjoy the movie. It wasn't like a favorite of all time movie, but it was fun. It was cheesy in parts, but it was fun. So one of the few five star books that I had this month was actually a reread that I read with my in-person book club and that's Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. I don't have a lot to say about this because you probably know all about Pride and Prejudice. Even people who haven't read the book have probably seen the movie or know things about it. So there's really not a whole lot that I want to say about it except that it's wonderful. It was a perfect springtime read and I absolutely enjoyed it. The humor is so good, so top-notch and the despicable characters are absolutely despicable and the lovable characters are absolutely lovable. I feel like everybody was flawed in their own way and I just really enjoyed this so much. It was such a great reread. Well those are the books that I read in the month of April, several of which I started in March and several of which were super, super short. So if, even though I had a lot of books to talk about, I still feel like I didn't read as much as I normally do. And also I feel like my favorite books of the month were the non-fictions that I read, which is so unlike me. So I'm kind of like wondering to myself, like, am I entering my non-fiction like memoir biography era? Maybe. I'd love to hear from you in the comments down below. What have you been reading lately? What was your favorite book from April? And if you've read any of the books that I've read here, I would love for you to weigh in and share your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please hit like and also subscribe so you can continue to see more bookish content from me and I will see you again next time.